being here to those in person and also for those who are watching us live streaming. I will ask the board secretary to take role to establish a quorum for the record. Thank you. President Craighead? <coughs> here. Member Benitez? Here. Member Lopez? Present. Member Miller? Here. Member Otto? Here. And student member Aguilar? Present. Thank you. We have a, a quorum. Thank you. And now we will have our student from Milliken, Sadie Brown, lead us in the pledge. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Place your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For those of you present in the room, the board appreciates and supports community input at our meetings. During the meeting, there will be time for the public to comment on matters on the agenda and matters not on the agenda. For those who have not already submitted a request, we have provided forms for you available here with our board secretary. Um, if you wish to speak during the meeting, please fill out a form indicating your name and agenda item you wish to address. The board has been meeting in closed session today regarding matters listed on today's agenda. The board took action on the following items. Regarding item 3.1, confidential student matters, pursuant to California Education Code 35146, the board voted 5-0 to expel four students. The first student, ID number 3865, was expelled in compliance with Education Code Section 48900. The second student, ID number 2510, was expelled in compliance with Education Code Sections 48900 and 48915. A third student, ID number 3399, was expelled in compliance with Education Code Section 48915. The fourth student, ID number 7797, was expelled in compliance with Education Code Section 48915. All four students were recommended to be considered for a suspended expulsion with an opportunity to attend another school within the district. The students will not be eligible to apply for readmission until after June 15, 2024. Regarding item 3.2, conference with legal counsel, existing litigation, the board approved by a 5-0 vote, a settlement and full release in workers' compensation case number 2185-5025. And finally, on item 3.3, the board voted 5-0 to approve a resignation settlement agreement providing consideration, accommodations, and general release. Uh, we are now at the adoption of the agenda. Mr. Miller, I understand you'd like to make an amendment? Yes, Madam President, I would like to, I would ask that on the consent calendar agenda, item 14.7, the approval of purchasing a contracts report, number 49 be placed on a separate separate additional consent calendar because I be, will be recusing myself on that item due to a potential conflict of interest under the government code. With that, I will make a motion to adopt <coughs> the agenda with the amendment of adding a separate consent calendar for item 14.7, number 49. Okay, um, would, you also, would you also like to make a motion to adopt the agenda as amended? Just yes. That, yes, that's what that was. Second. Any discussion? Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Um, we will adopt the agenda as amended, 5-0. Um, <clears throat> oh, now we get to introduce our student board member. So tonight we have Sadie Brown from Milliken. I invite you to um, come up to the microphone and tell us a little bit about yourself. Good afternoon, LBUSD board members, my fellow Rams, and to everyone else in attendance. It is an honor to be here today to represent Millican High School. 
My name is Sadie Brown, and I am a senior in the Peace Academy. I'm the ASB Governor of Clubs, a newly added position to our executive board team, and I also serve as the co-president of Milliken's Female Leadership Academy and Jewish Student Union. Milliken has had a really great beginning to the 2023-2024 school year. With lots of fun club activities, an incredibly successful homecoming, thriving sports teams, amazing cultural events, and plenty of future college and career assistance, Rams with all different interests have been able to stay quite involved. To start off, we had a fantastic two-day club rush event, which included over 60 student organizations that are active on campus, 10 of which are brand new. It was inspiring to see the great range of options for everyone from the always fabulous fashion club to the very welcoming gender sexuality alliance club to our dedicated engineering club. Students were invited to walk around during lunchtime to explore the various offerings for the school year by visiting student run booths. A perfect example of the great success of Club Rush is our relatively new Rams Without Limits Club, which reached many people and brought in lots of new members. This club gives neurodiverse students in the special education program a safe and supportive environment to dance and do movement activities with their peers that are in both special and general education. As a senior, I really enjoyed walking around and seeing so many familiar faces of my classmates that have stepped up to take on leadership responsibilities for, for their last year of high school. An awesome way to stay engaged and give back to the Millican community. Our clubs in ASB kept busy for several weeks as we, prepare, as we prepared for one of our major events of the school year, homecoming or HOCO as many Rams call it. This year, keeping with our overarching 2023-2024 theme of fairy tales, Homecoming featured different storybooks from our early childhood. This was mostly apparent in our creative dress-up days throughout the week, such as the Sleeping Beauty, aka PJ Day, that had an approximately 75% student and staff participation rate, an extremely high number for a high school spirit day. On the Friday of Hoko Week, we did a total pink out that lasted from morning till night in honor of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. To keep with the children's book idea, Pinkalicious was the story of the day, along with our homecoming football game and dance event theme of Barbie that evening. We had the Hoko Carnival that, af that afternoon with lots of fun food items, interactive carnival games, a full-sized rock wall, and much more. Everybody quickly turned around after the carnival to get ready for our highest attended game of the season against Cabrillo. We welcomed back former Rams and recognized our varsity seniors as we won the final game of the Moore League season. There were many outstanding performances by advanced dance, marching band, color guard, chamber choir, an ASB flash mob, and even young students in the district cheering alongside our own Millican cheer squad. At halftime, the homecoming court was invited up on stage for the final results where we crowned Jesse Rodriguez and Angie Delgadio as Hoko King and Queen, followed by an exciting fireworks show. To end our Barbie homecoming strong, Ram switched gears into party mode for the Hoko dance in the quad. The, the night was complete with life-size Barbie boxes, photo booths, karaoke, a DJ, and an inflatable obstacle course amidst other amusing activities. It was the perfect final homecoming for my friends and me, and I'm confident most people there would agree with that. The Ram Pride surely didn't stop with homecoming. In addition to lots of other Millican happenings, a huge piece of our school spirit is surrounding our many sports teams, especially our fall teams that had terrific seasons this year. As you likely have seen in the news, cross country runner Jason Para became Millican's first ever state champion athlete. On a similar note, Football player Ryan Pelham was selected to play in the prestigious Army All-American football game. 
Some other notable successes include establishing our first ever girls flag football team, boys cross countries winning more league, and having multiple teams make it to CIF. These athletic accomplishments have been featured in our weekly Millican Athletics newsletter, a newer project that I've had the pleasure of working on this school year as a lead design contributor. Millican has also been doing a wonderful job of emphasizing the diverse cultural backgrounds we have in our school community by hosting events to teach about and celebrate students' varied heritages. Some examples of this were our recognition of Hispanic Heritage Month through a ballet folklorico dance performance and providing materials for hundreds of students to play Loteria during lunch. Filipino American History Month celebration was done through traditional Tanikling dance and free lumpia and puto and our Dia de los Muertos festivities included a beautiful community ofrenda and a mariachi performance. Additionally, our recent K-pop club random play dance event brought out, brought out K-pop clubs from all over the district. We will also be having our annual 562 night market celebrating Asian American culture for the third year. Lastly, many student groups have shared their cultures with the Millican community through speaking during morning announcements. This has been a great way for us to celebrate our diversity on campus and empower students to be proud of their identity while increasing the level of cultural awareness and engagement. Following our slogan of the year, One Community, Many Stories, it's been truly impactful to listen to, lift up, and amplify student voices more now than ever before. Providing support and resources to students to achieve their goals is one of Millikan's biggest priorities. One of the ways this is reflected on campus is through our incredible College and Career Center, where there are always helpful and dedicated professionals around to provide all forms of guidance. We've even had two events to support our seniors during this stressful and busy time the College and Career Fair and the SWARM program to give seniors some additional opportunities to work on college apps. The College and Career Center has been very well received by students and is a highlight of our Millican offerings. Now that we are a good amount into December, various Millican activities are taking place as we head towards winter break. We are currently in the middle of our ASB campaign season where we have student leaders running for our executive board positions and class presidents. Holiday festiv festivities are also getting started around campus with toy drives, candy cane holiday grams, preparations for our perfor performing arts assembly right before winter break, and much more. It has been a wonderful school year so far, and there's so much to look forward to, especially for my fellow seniors and me. Beginning to wrap up my time at Millican is very bittersweet, and I'm proud to say it's been a great journey over the past three and a half years. If you have any questions about what else is going on at Millican, I'm happy to try my best to answer them for you all. Thank you again for having me today, and go Rams. I don't know if we have questions for you, but um, <laughs> did you bring somebody with you um, that you'd like to acknowledge? Yes, um, today with me I have my dad, Adam, my grandmother, Susie, and my grandpa, Bruce. <laughs> Three of my proudest supporters. Um, let's see, unless anybody has any questions, I know we're very impressed with that report. Thank you. Um, then we'd like to invite you up um, to, what, excuse me? Oh, yes, I did forget to ask. Um, because you mentioned you were a senior, and it's kind of that time of year, um, we would like to know what your plans are for next year. Yes, um, thank you for asking. I am currently applying to um, several schools, um, all of which are actually out of state. So um, I haven't heard back any decisions yet or anything, but I'm very excited and hoping to study political science or public policy. Okay, very impressive. Um, we wish you well in that. In the meantime, if you'd like to come up here with us and we'll get some pictures, we'll uh, take a little break to do that. Thank you.
We are um, just letting Sadie know about our Millican connections over here. <laughs> the, the Ram family uh, runs deep, runs deep on the dais. Um, okay, so next on the agenda, we have our um, recognitions and acknowledgments, so I'll turn our attention to the screen. Oh, no. Sorry, oh yes. Um, yeah. And, and uh, Sadie, uh, I've, I did forget to mention that you're welcome to stay for the duration of the meeting, or you can go and celebrate with your family. It's up to you, but we understand it's a school night, um, so uh, whatever you choose to do. You're welcome. And in the meantime, we'll turn our attention to the screen and uh, see what we have. BSU stands for Black Student Union. And basically what we do is we welcome all students, but we really try to highlight and appreciate the black culture at Millican and in Long Beach in general. Here at Millican, the Black Student Union serves a great purpose. Black students here are a minority, so this creates a space for students to come and feel completely comfortable. They do not need to code switch, they do not need to change who they are. They can come and just be themselves. We are building bonds, we are playing games, we are also giving out information more about black history and what truly has happened. I feel more represented and hurt than I've like truly ever felt. We do actually ask people how they are feeling about certain things around the world or even in our school, in our own environment. We even get opportunities to talk to staff members, uh, teachers, counselors, principals on the matters that we have and how we feel and they appreciate our feedback all the time. It gives me a sense of belonging, like knowing that I, in a predominantly white school, knowing that I have students that look like me who also have the same academic goals as me. It's super empowering knowing that like our community, our school, the district's really investing in us and that everybody wants to come together and make this happen and make a really good safe place for black students. This is my third high school. And so to have the other two experiences at the other high schools, like we had nothing like this. And so it does, it's really special what we've got here at Millican. It's always so uplifting to see the good that's happening throughout the district. I do enjoy our little moments. Um, let's see. Okay, now we are at um, public testimony and um, we, we don't have any, okay, nobody to speak on items listed on the agenda. So um, for items not listed on the agenda, I see we have um, pe uh, people for that. And comments on an item not listed for discussion today must be about issues that are within the jurisdiction of the board. Please note that due to California law, we the board cannot enter into a discussion on any items not listed on the agenda. Board members or staff may ask clarifying questions or provide clarification regarding public comments, but such discussion is limited. Each speaker will be given up to three minutes and will spend a total of 30 minutes um, on public comment. So first up, we have Michael, and I think the last name is... Faraci. Faraci, thank you. Hello. Hi, my name is Michael Faraci, and I'm coming to you today speaking as a parent from Los Cerritos Elementary School. On November 13th, my son's elementary school, along with another school, attended Camp Oaks. The informational packet endorsed by Long Beach Unified School District Superintendent states that cabins would be supervised with a ratio of one counselor per eight student. Further expounding that hazing, bullying, threatening, or causing physical harm is unacceptable and parents would be required to pick up their children if they commit such an offense. You can imagine our sadness and disbelief when our son returned to tell us that he was in a cabin with 16 boys and one counselor. The boys from the other school outnumbered our son's school and they were ganged up on. Our son was pulled from his bunk in the middle of the night by three boys, dragged into the bathroom, and physically assaulted. He was told that if he reported this to an adult, they would kill him in his sleep. Our son's pants were pulled down multiple times throughout the week. 
The F word and the N word were repeatedly used in the cabin. Our son shared this information with the counselor to which he replied, I don't F and care, man the F up, pulling the blankets over his head, returning to watching anime on his phone. None of the perpetrators were removed from the cabin the entire week. I've mentioned only a small number of offenses that have personally affected my son, but his friends have shared similar stories. Upon learning of these assaults, the parents of the boys in that cabin wrote a group email to the camp principal, our superintendent, and the school principal detailing the physical, psychological, sexual, and verbal abuse that they encountered. Each child had a similar story and each parent requested their child not be excused from class to discuss these traumas unless a parent were present for support. Since that group email was sent on November 18th, we have received one response from the camp director stating he will investigate. We have received another concerned email and phone call from the children's teacher. Today, 19 days later, we have not received a response from the superintendent or the principal. The superintendent and the principal did not express any concern for our children that we entrusted in their care for their first camp experience. The principal did, however, find the time to remove the boys from class without parental permission, placing them in the auditorium to tell them that she was disappointed that they hadn't handled themselves better at the camp. As a parent, this is so disheartening to see our children treated like this. Blaming the victim is unacceptable. Long Beach Unified and Camp Oaks have failed to protect our children. There are clear safety violations at this camp and a correction plan needs to be implemented. I'm calling on the board to launch an inquiry, inquiry into the Camp Oaks and to hold the administration involved responsible for upholding their own rules and regulations. I'm, I'm sorry, your time is up. I'm sorry to hear this. Mr. Suarez, are you, have you made a note so we can follow up on this? Thank you. Um, our next speaker is uh, Ruthie. Hi, thank you for having me here. Um, my name is Ruthie Heiss. I'm from the Long Beach Green Schools campaign. I'm back. <laughs> I missed you guys. I mostly missed Mr. Eglund, but I missed you guys too. <laughs> um, I'm here in part to recognize the pretty astoundingly great work we did as part of the Sustainability Coalition over the summer. Um, as part of Vision 2035, we had our own coalition. After the policy was passed, um, we're moving into the building up a task force to implement those regulations, but over the summer, we were able to plan out in the basically the next 15 years what our priorities are sustainability-wise. This included greening schools, um, including climate education, but I was really astounded, all electrifying Washington, which I am really, really, really excited about. Um, this was much more ambitious than I ever thought um, would come into place at LBSD in terms of sustainability wise, and I'm proud of what the work we accomplished. At the same time, seeing all of these ambitious new plans written up, I was reminded of the fact that at the school I go to, I struggled to implement recycling. Recycling is a basic sustainability agreement that was, should have been implemented and standardized in 2012 when I was five. I'm 16 now. Um, in my freshman year, me and Ms. Wassinger, who's part of the Think Green team, worked with the city in order to get blue bins. Um, but then because of lack of education, the blue bins weren't treated well. In addition, we worked with the, with the special ed, ed kids who did a work, uh, work training program where they're basically picking up the recycling bins and taking them to the big purple bins outside, which I feel is kind of morally not the greatest thing. In addition, custodial are not properly communicated with about the fact that they have to take these blue bins, put them in the purple bins, and then after that, um, take the purple bins out to be collected by the city. That collection by the city, Ms. Wassinger also organized. It was not organized um, by our facilities at school. Because of this, the custodial are not clear on what their responsibilities are in managing this part of waste. So the purple bins stacked and stacked and stacked up until they were too heavy to be taken out and they threw them in the landfill. Um, this is not okay. It's a responsibility of the district to meet basic um, sustainability criteria. That, was in, that came into place by Cal Recycle in 2012. However, come January 1st, there's a new Senate Bill 1383 that calls for the district to organize its waste as in compost and food redistribution. The Think Green team, which was 
piloted at um, Keller and three other, two other middle schools passed a resolution that after our hard work basically cemented a solution to this. We would sort, like we did at these middle schools, composting, recycling, and waste redistribution. Come um, January 1st, when this is not met, we have the ability to have CalRecycle investigate this issue. So I hope you guys can find a solution before then. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have Micah. Um, hi, my name is Micah Harris. I'm a junior at Poly High School. Um, I just like to uh, comment on more personal accounts of the recycling at our school. Um, first, with the um, more uh, recycling in classrooms, uh, there have been uh, there's been a lack of recycling in classrooms and actually uh, mandating that teachers uh, actually recycle and having kids uh, use those recycling bins properly. So they have been mistreated and many um, have been not using them due to students not um, treating them correctly. Uh, these blue bins were also uh, provided by a school librarian, um, a staff member, um, and uh, this was due to the lack of action um, of the district providing blue bins so that there could be more proper uh, recycling. So there, sorry, um, so the recycling has been a huge problem, but it is improving. But we'd like to see more improvement on this, as Ruthie was saying. So hopefully by January 1st, when it is made legal, or sorry, when, um, when, okay, sorry. Um, Um, when more of these uh, policies are made uh, into law, um, we'll hopefully see more of the action taking place. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next we have Tori. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, my name is Tori Sylvester, and it is a pleasure to be here in front of all of you representing Sato Academy's Green Team. We're here to discuss district collaboration for the allocation of funds to green school clubs and promote education on environmental sustainability and awareness. Sato's Green Team recently invested in a TerraCycle bin. TerraCycle processes typically non-recyclable items, such as 3D filament, food wrappers, certain plastics, and more. This program will recover immense amount of waste. However, green teams as a, as a whole cannot shoulder the cost of over $300 every few months. If TerraCycling is successful, a district subsidy would substantially assist high school's implementation. Additionally, LBUSD students statistically are woefully undereducated on subjects related to environmental awareness. Despite the work of individual green teams, the overwhelming majority of students at several high schools are significantly below the state average in science proficiency, according to U.S. News and World Report. And our district specifically is 23% below the state standard for the same metric. The figure measures the student assessment scores in this core area, reflecting a lack of district support around the subject. A large part of the science curriculum includes biology, ecology, and sustainability. A recent poll concluded that the vast majority of Sato students wished for some change to the curriculum that involved additions of guest speakers and exploratory projects. The implementation of a universal environmental science and activism course in every high school across the district would be a giant leap forward in education access to sustainability and could propel the Green School Club movement forward. With increased district support, the education of our student bodies would be greatly bolstered along with their knowledge of environmental awareness and related issues. 
Furthermore, the same poll, the same poll re revealed that 90% of Sato students care deeply about the environment, and 62% believe that the district should be substantially involved in environmental education, not just the school. However, over half of students feel that the district is not adequately educating on environmental dangers. This indicates a strong pattern in student dissatisfaction with district accountability of environmental education programs. Guest speakers, projects, field trips, they're not free. The clubs simply can't afford to direct such a large portion of their funding to these activities, which has been a major hindrance in the promotion of environmental awareness for students on these campuses. We urge the district to take proactive steps to enhance environmental education for the benefit of our students and the community at large. In summary, we request that you allocate funds to the individual green school clubs and extend environmental course curricula across the district to expand access to the growing effort in recycling management and environmental sustainability. It's time to become part of the solution. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Next we have Luna. Um, hello, uh, my name is Luna Salazar. I'm a junior at Lakewood High School and part of Green School's campaign at uh, Lakewood High School. Long Beach Unified School District passed uh, Board Policy 3510.1 and disappointingly um, has not had enough effort put into it. During the past week, um, myself and other members of the club uh, went around campus collecting data for uh, recycling bins. And sadly enough, less than half of the schools on our campus had school provided recycling bins. And those classrooms who did um, had either brought them on their own or were provided by the special education department. This should not be an issue at our school. Um, the district should be providing this. And yeah, uh, after talking with uh, teachers about this recycling issue, because we went to basically every classroom on campus, um, we found out that there were other issues with recycling at our school. One of those being students putting uh, trash in the bins, um, being really not informed about the recycling bins. and we see this as like lack of education of, about recycling at our school, which it shouldn't be up to the students. This is something that state law requires the district to provide this education. And um, something else that came up specifically at our school is that no one is responsible for picking up the recycling at our school. Neither city of, Lake, of Lakewood or city of Long Beach likes to take accountability for our recycling. As well as this, four to five years ago, a waste audit was recorded, and after repeated request was never published, I personally and other Green School campaign members think that it is completely unacceptable. Now, if we see this problem continue to happen in the basically the continuation of no effort, we have no problem filling out the Cal Recycle complaint form to investigate the district's management of this code. Thank you. Um, thank you. Next, we have Kim Tabari. Good evening, all. I am providing comments on a more personal and community matter on the subject of personal integrity of board members. About a month ago, I met with a board member and I was looking forward to hearing words of encouragement and offerings on the subject of running for one of the two seats currently up for election in 2024. To be clear, I am not here to call anyone out, but it is important to publicly share some of what community deals with. Sadly, I was asked by that board member not to run for office this year. Perhaps consider doing it in 2028. I'm gonna take a breath and let those words sink in. I went back to review the November 1st board meeting when your very own board consultant, AJ, stood in this very room and expressed that as a board, you have the responsibility to hold info sessions with the community about running for a board seat. That has not happened. There is zero information on your website about open seats. Community members have to figure it out for themselves. Instead, what is happening is a special board meeting on Friday, which also happens to be the last day of filing for office. It looks and feels like bullying, Trump-like tactics to game the system. 
It feels disingenuous to the public and sadly disappointing. I will leave you with three things in my minute. You are elected by the people, for the people. Solidarity means standing with people, especially those impacted by inequities. And three, I am the first person to receive a bachelor's, a master's, and a doctorate degree in my family, and I will be the first person in my family running for public office. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next we have Stephanie Anderson. Hello, my name is Stephanie Anderson and I teach sixth grade at Mirror K through eight. I am also the parent of a fifth grader at Los Cerritos Elementary who has been there since kindergarten. This is my third year with LBUSD, but my 13th year teaching. I am here today to discuss student safety. My son recently returned from Camp Oaks. His school went the week before Thanksgiving break. I was very hesitant to allow him to attend because of general safety concerns and motherly paranoia. It was his first ever sleepaway camp experience. Well, my son was not safe at camp, and unfortunately, my concerns ended up being valid. Los Cerritos attended camp with another school. Cabins were mixed with 14 students, seven from each school. Unfortunately, the students my son's cabin was paired with from the other school were, in my son's words, the most disrespectful kids I have ever been around in my life. Let me just add that my son has been in attendance at the YMCA before and after school programs since kindergarten and has attended summer day camps with the Y for years. After communicating with other parents whose children were in the same cabin, we soon realized what was supposed to be one of the best memories of their lives was instead a traumatic experience. An experience that included the use of constant profanity allowed by the counselor, physical attacks such as punching, slapping, water being poured on them while they were trying to sleep, having objects thrown at them in their bunks, light being shined in their faces while trying to sleep, taunting such as turning the lights off and locking the doors while they were using the restroom, taking stuffed animals, putting them in the toilet and peeing on them, just to name a few. My son was scared to go to sleep every night for fear of being harassed or assaulted. We also discovered that while the worst of it was in the cabin at night, these same boys were exhibiting very inappropriate behaviors during the day as well, including sexual harassment of the girls, which was noticed by many adults there. When my son first shared his experience with me, I wish I could say I was surprised. However, as a middle school teacher for the district, I am all too familiar with the lack of accountability and consequences for students who bully, harass, and disrupt classes all day long. A previous student at my school was allowed to terrorize our campus for years before finally being removed after a lawsuit and media attention. As a district that prides itself on equity, I am constantly wondering where is the equity for students who want to learn, have positive experiences with their peers, and be in safe and respectful environments. How were these students whose inappropriate behavior surely did not just appear at camp even allowed to attend a privilege like this? Why did LBUSD and Camp Oaks not follow their own handbook policies on dealing with student behavior? Why were our many concerned emails barely acknowledged by the district? Why did the one response we did get take absolutely no accountability for the terrible experience our boys suffered through? My intentions speaking today are to make sure real change is made for the future fifth graders attending camp this school year. No student should have to go through what my son and his friends experienced. I also encourage the district to take a real look at what equity for all students actually means and looks like. Allowing students to suffer daily at the hands of other students is not equitable. Thank you. <laughs> next, next we have Spencer. Spencer? I don't have a last name. Hello, everyone. Can y'all hear me? Okay. Hello everyone, my name is Spencer, they he pronouns. I have been involved with Californians for Justice since 2016, and I am also a North Long Beach resident from birth. So today I am here standing with you all, uh, in front of you all alongside Californians for Justice, who have been targeted by racist and xenophobic harassment for our support for Palestinian human rights. So we are here calling on the district to protect students and partners from attacks and affirm their right to advocate for Palestine. As a student, as a child, I did not feel a lot of c love or connection with my family or in my school around me. But I found it at Californians for Justice among other peers and I also found my first caring adult there. Someone who helped me see myself and understand my queerness when my family did not want to accept me. 
Seven years later, I am still here with Californians for Justice, and some of the things that I've done as a student leader with CFJ are uh, starting the chapter at Lakewood High School, where I made connections with teachers and the principal who was there at the time. I organized a town hall for board members, some of them who are on the board here today, and we got to make connections and meet them. And lastly, I met with the past superintendent Steinhauser um, in a meeting where we discussed the future of students at OBOC, which eventually led to our first internal bias training in 2019 that was led by students for educators. So I can tell you all that CFJ's work in LBOSD is grounded in decades of learning, deep relationship, and collaboration with district and school staff, community members, and families. Our partnership with LBOSD developed after years of collaboration with these groups that I mentioned to improve school culture and meet needs of historically marginalized students. Through our current partnership, we facilitate spaces for school equity teams to develop and implement equity plans they designed to meet the unique needs of their school site. Excluding CFJ from school sites or ending this partnership would be a huge disservice to the entire community and our student leaders who have found their voice in our, in our meetings and our workshops. So we are here in solidarity with our Jewish, Jewish siblings and believe Jewish people belong and have a right to safety. And that's why we are firm in our understanding that the movement for justice in Palestine is an anti-racist movement and includes opposing all acts of anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and oppression in all of its forms. We will continue fighting for a liberated world and a racially just education system where all of our communities feel a sense of belonging and feel safe. Thank you all. Thank you. Next we have Omar. Good evening, Superintendent Baker and Board of Education. My name is Omar Cardenas. I'm a father of two, resident of District 2 Poly neighborhood and a community leader working alongside youth for, in Long Beach for the past 10 plus years. I'm here standing alongside California for Justice students and staff who have been targeted by racist and xenophobic harassment and doxing attacks for their support for Palestinian human rights. We call on the district to protect its students and parents from these attacks and affirm their right to advocate for safety, freedom, and humanity of all Palestinians. CFJ has a long-standing legacy of fighting for human rights, racial justice, liberation, and safety for all communities, especially those that have been historically oppressed across California and especially here in Long Beach. For the last 26 years, we've organized multiracial and multi-generational communities to improve access to quality education, fair wages, healthcare, and housing, and reduce the criminalization of people of color. This moment is no different. We stand against oppression in all its forms, racism, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, homophobia, transphobia, and sexism. Our vision for a racially just and relationship-centered school is tied to a larger vision for liberation for all our communities. We are here in solidarity with our Jewish siblings and believe that anywhere in the world, Jewish people belong and have a right to safety. Real safety, however, does not grow out of censorship, guns, walls, legal apartheid, or a police state. Real safety is built in solidarity with those fighting for a more liberated world. That is why we, af we are firm in our understanding and conviction that the movement for justice in Palestine is an anti-racist movement and includes opposing all acts of anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and oppression in all its forms. We will continue to fight for a liberated world and a racially just education system where all our communities feel safe and belong. We call on the district to protect its students, families, and parents from these attacks and affirm their right to advocate for Palestinian human rights by continuing its partnership with Californians for Justice and proactively support its black, brown leaders in continuing their important work to create racially just and relationship center schools here in Long Beach with joy, dignity, and safety. We call on you to condemn the anti-Palestinian, anti-black, and anti-Semitic, and all other forms of racism and Islamophobia targeting its students, educators, and staff. Thank you, have a good night.
Thank you. Next we have Shia. Hello, uh, my name is Shia. I'm a senior at Lakewood High School and a member of Californians for Justice Equity Design Team at my school. Um, I am standing here alongside with my peers in Californians for Justice who have been painted to be anti-Semitic for our solidarity for, with Palestine. Um, we call on the district to protect its students and partners right from these attacks and affirm their right to advocate for Palestine. Um, through CFJ's equity design team, I collaborate with my teachers and essentially make our school a better place for all students, but especially black and brown students. Sorry. With CFJ's in our, without CFJ's in our school site, student voice would be reverted back to unimportant or inaccurate in our district. Without these spaces that CFJ gives us, it takes away the positions of, I wouldn't use the word power, but the positions of student voice that students that look exactly like me have. Without CFJ, I wouldn't be standing here before you today. Um, in CFJ, we do not have a hidden agenda. Our agenda is simple. We want the Long Beach Unified School District to be a place where every student is represented honestly in classrooms and curricula and where they are safe to be in critical dialogue supportive of democratic participation across differences. We are, in, we are in solidarity with our Jewish siblings and believe that anywhere in the world, Jewish people belong and have a right to safety. Safety should not be through censorship or things of that nature. Again, we want to call on our district to protect its students, families, and partners from these attacks and affirm their right to advocate for the Palestine human rights. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, we have time for a couple more. Next we have Sydney. Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Sydney. I've been involved with CFJ for three and a half years. I go to Poly, and, um, Poly High and I'm currently a senior. I have stayed in CFJ and am continuing to stay in CFJ because it fights and speaks for those who can't. We, the youth, use our voices and opinions for those who can't. Today is no different because I stand here today alongside Californians for Justice who have been targeted by racist, xenophobic harassment and doxing attacks for their support for Palestinian rights. We call on the district to protect the students and partner rights from these attacks and affirm their right to advocate Palestine. As a student in LBUSD, I ask of you to stand with us today because we, the students, don't feel safe nor comfortable because the attacks we impact our ability to speak our truths. So today, as a student here at LBUSD, I've been a student all my life. We ask you as students, because we're all students from LBUSD, to stand with us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have uh, Anna Yelly or Anyeli. Please help me with the pronunciation. It's okay. It's pronounced Anjali. Yeah. Hello and good evening. My name is Anjali Aldana. I am currently a senior at Cabrillo High School, and I have been with CFJ for currently two years, and I plan to continue being in CFJ even after high school. I am here to speak about the positive impact that CFJ has had on me. CFJ, CFJ believes that young people are the leaders and that we need to transform our communities and work through empowering and building the skills of youth people to exercise their own agency, critical thinking, and leadership. For example, this past weekend, I actually had the opportunity to lead a community building workshop for 18 of my peers from five different high schools. Additionally, this year, I had the space to speak on a student panel in front of teachers, counselors, and community members. And I shared my story about how building and maintaining relationships within a student's school life is important. When I was there, it felt like such a surreal moment Moment. For the first time, I felt like my voice was being listened to, as well as I was being able to, I was able to listen to other people's stories and experiences, and I was just able to connect with them. After the panel, people in the audience were talking about how grateful they were to be able to hear our stories and that they've learned so much from us. And I kind of find that funny because it's always been the students have to learn from adults and now it's the adults learning from the students and now we are working together to have a better relationship. I am so grateful for CFJ to learn about issues that aren't normally talked about in classrooms and they have encouraged us to use our own critical thinking skills to be able to form our own opinions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have 
time for one more. Uh, Jacqueline. President Craighead, can yes. uh, we extend time? How many more do we have left? I currently have two more. Can we extend time so that we have an opportunity to hear from everyone tonight? Um, look President around. Craighead, it's my understanding there's that. a group of people outside who are filling out forms. I don't know how many more. I'm, I'm or, talking or about the, the ones that we have in hand yeah. right now so that we can finish at least these. Okay, so we'll need... Um, We'll need six minutes on top of our final speaker. Would somebody like to make a motion? Can I motion to extend um, comment time another 15 minutes to allow some of the uh, individuals in the outside to speak? Is there a second? Second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, we will extend time for 15 minutes. So, Jacqueline. My name is Jacqueline Oliveira Cruz, and I am a senior at Lakewood High School, and I am here to support CFJ. I am here to support CFJ because CFJ is being targeted as an organization that is supporting racist and xenophobic attacks for support for Palestine. I support Palestine, I support CFJ because of how they have positively impacted my life in many ways. One being they have been able to give me a voice to say my opinion on racial and educational justice by being on a panel and sharing my opinion on to be heard by future teachers and educators. They have gave me the opportunity to also be part of cultural fair at my school that uplifted and celebrated all the cultures at Lakewood High School while showing solidarity. In addition, CFJ has allowed me to connect with other students from different backgrounds and other students from different backgrounds and cultures on a deeper level because of our similar backgrounds and beliefs and interests. I also support CFJ because in, they believe in a racially just and relationship-centered schools. With CFJ, black and brown and indigenous students and other communities are able to express their voices on these matters, which also includes that the education of students and peers isn't minimized on the struggle of Palestinians and other communities across the globe. Additionally, CFJ and I are in solidarity with the Palestinian freedom from apartheid, while also standing with our Jewish siblings and their belonging in the world. I will continue fighting for all those who are being oppressed, and so will CFJ. And we will continue to support and raci a racially just education where all of our communities feel safe and belong. Finally, we call on the district to protect its students, families, and partners from these attacks and affirm their right to advocate for Palestinian human rights. We continue its partnership with and to continue its partnership with Californians for Justice and proactively support its black and brown leaders in continuing their important work with to create racially just and relationship-centered schools in Long Beach with joy dignity, and safety. Thank you. Um, I have a, a form with no name on it, so um, that was in the count. So the last form I have in hand is for Janice Mendez. Hello, everyone. My name is Janice Mendez, and I joined CFJ when I was just a sophomore in high school and I've been here for the past seven years. Um, and today I'm standing alongside Californians for Justice, students and staff who have been targeted by racist, xenophobic harassment and doxing attacks for their support for Palestinian hum human rights. We call on the district to protect its students and partners right from these attacks and affirm their right to advocate for Palestine. Personally, I wholeheartedly support CFJ because I have personally felt the immense impact that this org has on youth of color because I was one. CFJ built my leadership from the ground up and gave me a voice as a youth and even as a young adult. CFJ represents everything that I believe in. CFJ has a longstanding legacy of fighting for human rights, racial justice, liberation, and safety for all communities, especially those who are historically oppressed. 
CFJ was founded in 1995 in the wake of racist violence and policies like Prop 187 and Prop 209 targeting historically marginalized communities. For the last 26 years, we've organized multiracial and multigenerational communities in places like Long Beach and across California to improve access to quality schools, fair wages, health care, and housing, and reduce the criminalization of people of color. This moment is not different. We stand with millions of others from all walks of life in solidarity with the people of Palestine to demand a ceasefire. There is a broad public support for a permanent ceasefire, according to a recent Reuters IPLOS poll, two-thirds of all Americans support the idea of a ceasefire. We stand against oppression for all its forms, racism, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, homophobia, transphobia, sexism. Our vision for racially just and relationship-centered schools is tied to a larger vision for liberation for all of our communities. We are in solidarity with our Jewish siblings and believe that anywhere in the world, Jewish people belong and have a right to safety. Real safety does not grow out of censorship, guns, walls, legal apartheid, or a police state. Real safety is built in solidarity with all those fighting for a more liberated world. That's why we, firm, we are firm in our understanding that the movement for justice in Palestine is an anti-racist movement and includes opposing all the acts of anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and oppression in all its forms. We will continue to fight for a liberated world and a racially just education system, allied with CFJ and their leaders, where all our communities feel safe and belong. We call on the district to protect its students, families, and partners from these attacks and affirm their right to advocate for Palestinian human rights by continuing its partnership with Californians for Justice and proactively supporting its black and brown leaders in continuing their important work to create racially just and relationship-centered schools in Long Beach with joy, dignity, and safety. We call on you to condemn the anti-Palestinian, anti-black, anti-Semitic, and other forms of racism and Islamophobia targeting its students, educators, and staff, and to establish channels for students to report incidents of discrimination or harassment and ensure that these reports are taken seriously and addressed promptly, and to provide resources for impacted students that are accessible. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Um, apparently, the group outside has decided um, not to submit forms to speak, so we will move on with the agenda. I'm sorry, the name, the one that you said didn't have a name. Oh, okay. So we'll have we'll have one more. All right. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jada. I'm a senior at Lakewood High School, and I'm here on the behalf of Californians for Justice. To, and I'm also here to use my voice to fight for what I believe in, which is black liberation, social justice, and human rights as a whole. Californians for Justice stands against all kinds of oppression, such as racism, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, homophobia, transphobia, and sexism. During my time with Californians for Justice, I was always and still able to fo form my own opinions and express my own beliefs. being social justice, human rights, which is why I stand behind the fact that the movement for justice in Palestine is an anti-racist movement and includes opposing all acts of anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and oppression in all of its forms. Before Californians for Justice, I was never given the space to speak, my, speak what I believe and I was never given the space to speak my truth and use my voice. And now with Californians for Justice, I was given that space along with the, along with the people um, within CFJ, the adults. They also have given me the strength to do things like this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and before you leave, we're going to need your name. We're going to need your name on the form. Thank you. Okay, we will uh, move on on the agenda to reports on our superintendent advisory groups. Um, we'll start with the business budget and policy development. So I will go ahead and give that report today. Um, the policies that we looked at um, we looked at four different policies. The first one is a new policy, and it is board policy 5145.2.
student freedom of speech. Um, for the most part, students have First Amendment rights unless it interferes with the safety or creates substantial disruption of the school's orderly operation. Um, and so that will be available to my colleagues uh, prior to the next meeting. And then um, up for revision, we have board policy 5141.21, administering medication and monitoring health conditions. And that one and board policy 6164.6, identification and education under section 504. Both of these policies are being updated to reflect um, state and federal law. So there's um, very small changes <coughs> to reflect those laws. And then on the last one, um, it's b board policy 0410, non-discrimination in district programs and activities. And there again, it's just a, a small revision to comply with state and federal laws. And these policies will be available, um, as I mentioned to my colleagues before our next board meeting. So this is just an information item. Um, and then next, we have instruction and student learning supports. Ms. Lopez. Thank you, and I'll be brief. Uh, we just discussed the expansion of the architecture, construction, and engineering mentoring program, which is currently at Jordan and will be expanding over to McBride. Um, and we uh, further discuss the contract, the $250,000 contract with the Boys and Girls uh, Club that's uh, going to support LBUSD students whose parents are currently attending LBCC. And that's, that's it, all for my report. Thank you. Next, we have workforce development. Mr. Miller. Yes, I just have two quick points as well. Uh, first off, the HRS team is working on goals aligned with the adult portrait as outlined in our Vision 2035. Obviously, uh, the work is focused on helping our uh, district employees during the entire cycle of hiring from obviously attraction to retirement. I mean, to the recruitment slash bringing them on board to the team until their retirement point. Uh, second, I wanted to speak to uh, the annual teacher recruitment fair. And so um, I spoke to it last board meeting. Uh, once again, uh, obviously, this is an important opportunity for us to attract some of the best talent in the educational sphere. Uh, one of the focuses, uh, one of the few changes that have occurred so, since my last report was that now the fair will be held same day, uh, but now it will be at Browning High School. And this will be focused towards our high need areas. So um, departments like special education, dual immersion, math, sciences, et cetera. That's my report. Thank you. And for student outcome focused governance, do we have a report from that group? Yes. Um, Mr. Otto. Thank you. Uh, yesterday, Dr. Benitez and I met with the Student Outcomes Focused Governance Advisory Group to review a draft of the data monitoring calendar that is being developed in alignment with our new uh, board goals and guardrails. We talked about how we'll uh, we, we talked about how we'll look at both quantitative and qualitative measures, including stories from teachers, students, and their caregivers, including all members of their families. We're working with district staff to further develop the calendar to be adopted by the board at an upcoming meeting after the first of the year. For those of you who don't know, we have been on a process for the last three years of adopting a student outcomes focused governance. What we've done is um, worked on and adopted goals and guardrails, uh, which are now um, uh, uh, we, we're working with and, de and, and to further develop and this monitoring calendar which we're working on is expected to be completed uh, in the next couple of months. 
So um, we're very excited about the work we're doing. We've been working closely with staff, and uh, we'll have a further report probably in January. Dr. Madam Benitez. President, yeah, uh, the only additional things I would add is um, I did ask our student outcomes focused governance team if they could provide our board um, um, additional information on how we're using the particular assessments to measure progress toward our goals. Um, I, I think it's good for our board, but also for our communities to know why what, what iReady is as an example and why we're using uh, those measurements to measure progress. And then the second thing is, I think it, it's also important to provide us and our communities um, with why we're using the proposed dates for the monitoring calendars. Um, short story is because they're in alignment with when we do our assessments. Um, so any information uh, that they could provide regarding that, I think would be helpful for us as we look to adopting our monitoring calendar in January. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and next on the agenda, we have our consent calendar. Um, this groups together the approval for routine agenda items and one action for efficiency. I'm going to remind everybody that we are separating out um, from agenda item 14.7, number 49. So when we vote on the consent calendar, it'll be everything but that one um, item. So we need a motion for the consent calendar. So moved. Second. Discussion? I do have a couple of questions. Item 14.4, the, uh, the dance and engineering courses uh, for middle school students uh, that do not require a textbook. What will teachers use to guide the, their lessons? And what assessments will teachers use to evaluate um, uh, students? And then there's also uh, there that uh, ELD opportunities um, are going to be incorporated. And what will that look like in the classroom? Thank you for that question. There are two new courses coming online. One is an exploring dance course in the middle school. It's a one semester course. Uh, we currently have a year-long beginning dance course. This is an option for probably six, incoming sixth grade students to explore dance as a potential interest. This second course is what we call one of our WOW courses, which is a world of work course. It is a one-quarter course in engineering. To accompany the other one-quarter courses that schools have an, as an option to introduce students to what we call sort of like pre-industry sort of uh, opportunities. This would build on our Project Lead the Way courses at the middle school level in seventh and eighth grade as an opportunity. This particular course uh, uses a project-based learning approach, which is actually something that we're piloting at the high schools as well. It is a, um, as the name dictates, sort of a project-based approach to collaborative learning an open-ended inquiry-based approach. So this particular course in support of ELD creates opportunities for students, really what rich learning opportunities to collaborate and leverage probably more of the productive ELD uh, domains around speaking and writing in presenting and analyzing crit and critiquing the engineering projects. They will leverage the resources that are available uh, through our curriculum office. So although there's no textbook that's provided, they are guided by state standards, which would then dictate or um, guide their assessments tied to those courses uh, based on the resources that are provided from our curriculum office, including a course outline, scope and sequence, and links to resources online. Thank you. I also have a question on item 14.6, number 17. Um, if you'd please explain what we're rejecting in terms of donations and gifts and why. Um, if this is a donation or a gift, um, why aren't we accepting it? Uh, because the way it's written here, it's not clear. And it is under donations and gifts. Yeah, just for clarification, we're asking the board to reject a claim against the district, it's, yeah, it's not a donation or gift, but rejection of a claim. Okay, so, but can I ask why it was in that same section? Yes, we, gen we, we, have, we haven't had these for a while, a reject, uh, asking the board to reject a claim, but it, it's historically been part of the business, uh, business department report. 
and we can we get any other details on this claim that we're rejecting? Yeah, um, some information was provided on this claim today with some confidential materials, and we sh we can certainly provide you some additional materials or reissue the material to you. Can I see it before we take a vote? Thank you. Is there any further discussion on the consent calendar? Two things that I would like to highlight, Madam Chair, is in um, uh, consent calendar 14.7, item, item four, uh, expressing our support for the Long Beach housing uh, promise. Um, just wanna highlight um, our district's commitment to promoting access to quality and affordable housing for all Long Beach residents. Dr. Baker, some colleagues of ours, and some of our executive team attended a meeting a few weeks ago at Cal State Long Beach, um, promoting our, our um, system support uh, in addition to Long Beach City College and Cal State Long Beach for uh, the mayor's um, housing promise. And um, also wanted to encourage folks, uh, we had several school um, plans for student achievement that include uh, homeschool compact and parent and family involvement guidelines. Want to encourage our families, parents, caregivers, community members. Uh, best way to get engaged uh, is at our school site level. Uh, those plans lay a roadmap uh, out for what needs to take place for school improvement, parent and community engagement, and our homeschool, uh, uh, sorry, homeschool compacts. So I want to encourage everyone to check those out. They should be available vis-a-vis -vis the individual school uh, websites, right, Dr. Baker? Thank you. I do have one other question, sorry. On item 14.9, on uh, the adoption of resolution 120623-A, um, just, I'd just like to know if it's a common practice that uh, we're adopting a resolution regarding the cost of candidate statement and the length of their statement. Is this something that we do uh, every time there's an election? And if so? Yes, the county requires it, yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, any further discussion on the consent calendar? Okay, in that case, I will ask our board secretary to take a roll call vote. Thank you. Member Benitez? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Lopez? Aye. <coughs> Member Miller? Aye. Member Otto? Aye. And student member Aguilar, preferential vote? Aye. Thank you, that passes 5-0. Thank you. Now we will vote on item 14.7, number 49. Yes, we removed that from the consent calendar, and that's going to be an individual vote. So we need a motion on that one. Move to approve. I need a second. Does somebody like to second that? Did I not hear it? No one seconded. Nobody second. You can second. You can second. Yeah. I will second that one. Um, is there any discussion? I do have questions. Um, numbers 27 through 33 and 35. I, actually, we're voting on. On 14.7, correct? Yes, item number 49 only. We separated out that from the consent calendar. Item 14.7, number 49. Okay, so I am confused. So we've already voted on items 23, 27 uh, through 33 and items 45 through 59? Yes. yes. We did. Uh, there was confusion and I have, to be, I have to be honest because I did have some questions. So now we are strictly voting on the purchasing of the, <clears throat> 14 points. Yeah, like it's 14.7, number 49. 
just item 49. Yep. That's what we separated out. We talked about that when we adopted the agenda. I mentioned it when we started with the consent calendar and then again before this vote. We did. I, I, I do have to say that um, I thought there was some other sections that were part of this, but um, okay. So we're happy to accept item. your questions after the meeting and can answer them for you. Thank you. Okay, so any discussion on item number 49? Okay, um, I'll have our secretary take the vote. Thank you. Member Benitez? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Lopez? Okay, I do need to ask legal because this, is, this was part of the question that I had. So I think I'm just confused because we went ahead and separated it. Um, so yeah, what, now we're what, voting what's, and I- what's your, what's your question? I'm sorry, what's your question? Um, <clears throat> because we do have, so it's to provide. So this, this one in particular is $5 million to provide pro program support services for various projects throughout the, throughout the district. So we have several of those totaling, uh, well, not, not in this second, so I'll stick to this one, to this five million. So I just wanted a little bit more explanation. I know this is on facilities, but what, is, what are these, um, what are these projects, uh, what do they look like? Um, because we are, we are voting and we have a, already voted on quite a bit of, of, of money regarding um, support services for, for projects um, in the district. So we separate. So Mr. Strumpfer, we already started taking the vote. How do yeah. we deal with this? Well, if she has a, if she has a quick question before she votes, that's, that's acceptable. I don't know if okay. Mr. Miranda, um, Mr. Miranda any, uh, guidance you, on it. Will you help us with this one, please? <clears throat> Number 49, which is an agreement with Cordoba Corporation to provide program support services. And I'll take a few steps back. So over the course of the last month, month plus, I've actually addressed the board and sought out your help and support in approving various program, actually various pre-qualified pools of service providers for a number of different facets of our building program. One of those pools that was approved was one week title program support services, which includes uh, really the effective and effective management and oversight of our building program. Right, so we have a building program staff that the district has as in-house staff. That's a smaller team. We really rely on industry experts who have the expertise, the technical know-how to do a number of different things we need to, to manage an effective building program. So that could include services and support in the areas of fiscal oversight for a building program, um, industry knowledge and expertise with respect to contracts in the world of facilities, uh, project managers, assistant project managers, folks that effectively oversee this type of work. With respect to Cordoba, item number 49, they also have an industry expertise with respect to move management services, uh, where they have quality folks that help us uh, when it comes time to, to move folks within a site for in-house uh, phasing plans, also help us with space planning efforts across different uh, facets of our building program across many different projects in the district. Uh, this particular agreement is for a three year stretch, so it's a large dollar value, yet it's gonna encompass several projects over that three year stretch. Could include things like our expedited and accelerated measure E schedules, uh, where we've accelerated that timeline for several projects. New measure Q projects, including a few projects that were referenced today over at Washington, um, some campus safety efforts, solar efforts that are gonna encompass 16 sites, our start of the poly project, and, and a host of others. And I would just, just add, Ms. Lopez, if you have questions, this is a, as a consent calendar, if you have questions on a consent calendar, staff would be happy to answer beforehand before, so you don't have that issue of having this go by and missing it. But we'd be happy to answer those questions before the meeting for you. Thank you. Okay, so Member Lopez. I'll vote, vote aye. Thank you. Uh, Member Otto. Uh, in, a, in an abundance of caution, I'm going to abstain. Okay. And student member Aguilar preferential vote? Aye. Well, member Miller's abstaining, right? Uh, Correct. Abstain. Thank you. 
So that passes 3-0 with two abstentions. Okay. Um, now we will move to new business. Item 15.1 on the agenda. Presentation of Independent Audit Report 2022-2023. This is an information item only. Um, I would like to thank our team. Uh, we had an audit committee meeting and um, that involved labor partners, staff, the independent audit team. And uh, their presentation was so thorough, there were no questions on the audit. It was so wonderful. But if anybody um, has a question now, I'm sure that um, that can be answered. Anybody have any questions on that? No findings? Should I go ahead? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yes. Yeah, we have no findings. Um, I can take you through a quick um, just presentation. Um, my name is Gemma Tashinsky. I am a principal with Clifton Larson Allen, your independent audit firm. And as um, President Craig had said, we met earlier this afternoon to go over the results. Um, so I'll just give a really brief, brief recap since we, we did kind of a more thorough review, but we've issued an, an unmodified opinion. So that is the uh, best opinion we can render. That means that a financial statement user can rely on the information to make decisions. Um, and so that is in regard to your district audit. Um, we've got a couple different audits that we were engaged to do. So the district audit, clean opinion, um, financial statements are fairly stated. Uh, we had uh, no findings related to the financial audit. So we do as part of the audit process, we're required to gain an understanding of internal control and then report back if we have, if we see any issues. So no internal control issues. Um, so very positive, just great job in terms of your team doing the day-to-day -day accounting and then of course their closed process. In terms of the federal audit, because you do receive quite a bit of federal dollars, and so you're required to have um, an audit under OMB standards. And so we did look at, um, we were required to look at three programs this year, Title I, part of the normal rotation, Child Care Development Fund Cluster, so it's the federal child care money. Also, uh, normal part of rotation, but also because you had an increased funding, and so it hit the threshold for testing. And then your CARES Act money, you continue to have ESER and GEAR funds that you're still using, and so those are mandatory to be um, audited. They're considered higher risk um, dollars by um, the Office of Management and Budget. So we looked at all of those programs, and we have no findings. Uh, everything came back um, clean in terms of the areas of compliance that we were required um, to audit. And there's a, a guide we follow that tells us exactly what we need to look at. And then in terms of your state programs, so your um, the Education Audit Appeals Panel every year issues an audit guide that we have to follow in terms of the state funding. On pages 91 to 92 of your audit report, you'll see the, the laundry list of all the programs that are in the audit guide for the 22-23 year, and then it'll say which ones applied to you, which ones didn't, not everything applies. The biggest part of that focus is on attendance, of course, because that's the primary um, a, you know, mechanism for funding through LCFF. We tested 20 sites this year. Uh, we had no areas of non-compliance for attendance reporting. Um, also new this year was, um, one of the big areas new this year is transitional kindergarten. So we were required to look at that sample sites and we looked at 11 sites to make sure that your ratios were in compliance with the required student to teacher or adult um, for those classrooms. So um, clean, clean audit in terms of state compliance. And then last year you had, the district had three findings related to state issues and so we had to circle back and look at those. Um, independent study, master agreements last year, there were some that didn't have proper signatures, something was missing, uh, no items of non-compliance this year. Um, P2 and annual reporting last year, we had some issues just with um, updates being um, applied and, and reported. Um, no issues there this year. And then your unduplicated count, we had an error last year. So that's your, your CalPads, your reporting of your students that are free and reduced eligible um, or English language learners. And so we're looking to make sure there's support for their classification and CalPads. And so we had no issues um, with our testing this year on that. So a very clean opinion um, in terms of your um, audited financial statements. 
And then the other big piece is the bond audit. And so what you'll see in, in the report, there's three different measures that we're auditing. So we're auditing uh, measure K, measure E, measure Q. They're all in the same um, bound report that you got. So um, all in the same report, uh, we looked at all of them. So we do a financial audit to make sure that the financial, you know, the financial information that was presented in your unaudited actuals, um, you know, matches that we don't have any audit adjustments, so no audit adjustments there, so unmodified opinion. And then we look at the performance side of it, which is looking at the expenditures and making sure that it matches to what the voters had approved. So for Measure K, we tested 34 million of your expenditures. Uh, measure E, 38 million, and Measure Q, because there hadn't been a whole lot of expense yet, 2.4 million, and then on top of that, about 600,000 in salaries that are allocated to the different um, programs for your uh, project management and accounting and things like that. Um, so again, no items of non-compliance. Everything was um, as you know we would hope to find. Um, and so again, a clean opinion, and um, definitely want to thank the whole team. So the process is a very long process. We probably spend six to nine months on this in this audit, collaborating with management. Um, lots of discussions, not just with audit committee, but with um, management, with staff, with your sites. Um, and so we appreciate everybody's cooperation throughout the process, in particular, you, me, and her team, um, Renee, um, a lot of people. And then, of course, on the facility side as well, um, Sarah Slater, you know, we work with her quite a bit, um, but Ellen and also um, David. So uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. I don't think we have any questions, but I'd like to thank you for all that work. I know it's a long process, and I'm very happy to hear that our team is appreciated as much as we appreciate them. So thank you, everybody involved. Um, <clears throat> it, it makes it so easy that there are no findings. It's very straightforward. Thank you. So, thank you. Great. OK, next we have um, item 15.2, presentation of financial and performance. That was it, that was it yeah. where 15, I'm going to just lump all the so, so we just went through 15.1, 15.2, and 15.3. Yes. OK, that makes my job easier. Um, <clears throat> also, I like how we um, <coughs> crowdsource the facilitation of the agenda. Um, so I'm going to go to, did I miss something? No? I love the crowdsource. No. Oh, the crowdsource <laughs> thing? Uh, so, hey, it takes a village. Um, 15.4. Approval of pre-qualified uh, California Environmental Quality Act or CEQA consulting services firms. Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, any opposed? Any abstentions? How about our student board member with a preferential vote? Aye. Thank you. Um, then that passes 5-0 with, <clears throat> with one preferential vote. Um, item 15.5, approval of pre-qualified materials testing and inspection services consultants. Move for approval. Second. Any discussion? This is uh, not a question, but a point to, to make here. We have, over the last couple of meetings, uh, been asked to approve these pre-qualified groups, and we had a lengthy explanation at a previous meeting about how we go about doing that. And uh, I spent some time with our facilities folks and uh, uh, <coughs> to learn exactly what that process was and what it did, and I came away very, very impressed uh, because it gives an opportunity for fairness, it gives an opportunity for thoroughness, and to make sure that the people that we have performing these uh, roles uh, for the district are, really do it in a, uh, in, a, in a very high qualified way and in the best interest of the district. But the point I really want to make is that this way of doing things is part of 
this new student outcomes form of governance. And the reason that I say that is because what we said when we adopted this approach to governance was that we want to make sure that we spend at least 50% of the time we spend in board meetings on, um, on matters that have to do with student outcomes. And in order to do that, we need to, in a most effective and efficient way, address the other issues so we can talk about outcomes or things that are related to outcomes. By being able to not have to vote individually on, uh, uh, on our consultants, uh, it saves us a lot of time. It gives us a lot more time to do what boards are supposed to do, which is to fo focus on uh, student outcomes. And so I commend the district on this approach to this particular aspect of what it is that we do or how it is that we conduct our meetings. And uh, it seems to me that it's been very successful. Thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? And our student board member? Aye. Thank you. That passes 5-0 with a preferential vote from our student board member. And that brings us to uh, board reports. And Axel, I'm happy to start with you. First up, I would like to congratulate all of the high school seniors who submitted their college applications, and I wish them the best of luck with that. Also, I would like to say that the superintendent's advisory committee meets tomorrow to talk about uh, the, if our peers know about the graduate portrait. And lastly, I would like to wish everyone a good rest of their day. Thank you, Axel. It was very nice. Mr. Miller. <laughs> All right. I will be brief here. Uh, mm. Uh, first off, the last time we met, it was a little bit before Thanksgiving, right? And so I hope that everyone had a good holiday as I got to spend some quality time uh, with my family uh, in Lake Elsinore, which was pretty awesome. Uh, all things considered, <clears throat> we're entering the holiday season. I talked about it earlier. Um, uh, it's it's always a tough time for those who may have gone through a tough loss or may have uh, sometimes don't have the financial means to celebrate the holiday in the way they which they would like to. And so I'm always very appreciative of those community organizations who step out and help those in need. Uh, one group in particular who I wanted to give a special shout out to uh, for hosting an awesome gala. Uh, where they raised a little bit more than $15,000 for um, gifts for students uh, in the 2nd District, which is awesome. And that is uh, Snow on 15th Street. Uh, it was uh, an awesome opportunity, awesome event. Uh, I know I had a lot of fun, and I just wanted to give a special thank you to the entire committee who put that event together, and a special shout-out to Shane Hardy for the invitation and uh, for his support for young people in my, my district. That's all I have to report. Thank you. It's a wonderful reminder that in this <clears throat> in this holiday season, we have that spirit of giving, so I, I love that reminder. Dr. Benitez? Yeah, I'll be quick too, Madam Chair. I, I thank you, Axel, for reminding us of the stressful time right now around college applications. So I will also extend my well wishes to all the students that um, applied. And, and I would just say this, um, I'll speak to students. Uh, you'll, you'll end up where you were meant to be. Um, the university that you go to does not define who you are nor your success, and you will thrive. Uh, and be what you're meant to be. Uh, I know it's stressful. Uh, put it behind you and uh, look forward to your college and university experiences. Um, I, I do have one uh, thing to report on, on. I attended and had a chance to speak at um, last week's Best Start Central Long Beach convening. Um, these are organizations and community members that attend and, and fill up the hall uh, at every meeting that I've had a chance to attend of uh, doing critical work in early education. So um, we had a good conversation around their hopes and dreams and aspirations for children and students in Long Beach. 
And so, as, as we always do as, as school board members, uh, encourage them to stay engaged, stay vigilant. Um, this is a collaborative, collective effort for all of us in our communities, in our respective communities in, in, this, in this school district. Um, we have a role to play in, in all children's and students' success. So uh, just a big congratulations to um, all those parents and organizations and organizational reps that are working hard every day uh, with our little ones. Um, and, and they'll be um, in our district. If they aren't already, they'll be in our district very soon. Thank you. Mr. Otto. Thank you. Um, so um, f first, what I'd like to do is to go back to, uh, I attended a conference in San Diego for the Council of Great City Schools, which was very, very impressive. This is an organization of the primarily urban school districts throughout the United States, and it was an opportunity to learn a lot about what's going on in other places. We are very active members of this organization, and. Um, uh, and there was a lot uh, that uh, uh, that they presented that well, that we I was able to bring back and share with the district uh, going forward. And then I um, uh, last week was in Sacramento at the California School Board Association meeting where I am a delegate. And the theme of this meeting was mental health. And uh, there was a lot to be to be said on this subject. Uh, uh, the whole conference was organized or oriented around it. Um, the, um, uh, I was given the opportunity to make a delegate presentation on mental health and talked about what we do here at the Long Beach community, uh, at, at, at the Long Beach uh, School, Unified School District with regard to, um, uh, to mental health. Uh, Dr. Baker pro provided me with some materials, which I also shared with other members as we did a round table of many, many school districts in the state of California about how different places or different districts are handling uh, mental health uh, issues. Um, uh, then, I, and also at that conference, I, I was at a luncheon with, uh, that was, where the keynote speaker was uh, Eloy Oakley, who was the former uh, Chancellor of the uh, California uh, Community College uh, Association and who I know very, very well because he used to be the president at Long Beach uh, City College and in fact I had hired him a while ago. So uh, it was good to hear what he said and what he talked about was opportunities for diverse students for uh, college and other things that they can do in their lives and the ways that admissions and what students do are, are changing. It said, it's not just like Dr. Manita said, where you go, but it's how you achieve success. And we are learning as things change that we provide different opportunities for kids to, uh, to be successful in life and focus on success. Um, I, I raced back from that conference literally to just barely make the Belmont Shore Christmas Parade um, where I had an opportunity to, uh, uh, to uh, walk with the um, Wilson High School uh, uh, um, band and, uh, and a cheerleading group. Uh, uh, the, I'll tell you a, a little uh, aside on, on me and that is I, I, I literally had about five minutes when I got back into town to do that and I went to grab a coat in the um, in, in the closet to, to wear to keep me warm during the parade and I came out with a coat that had a Wilson logo on the front and since as Eric knows and other people know it's been brought up uh, before I went to Milliken so uh, so I said to my wife where did this come from and she said oh you remember our, our son and daughter went to Wilson and uh, that's probably one of theirs well it fit so it worked out well and uh, so uh, uh, the parade was very, very exciting and uh, gave us a great opportunity to showcase not only uh, the band and cheerleaders, but they had both the girls track, track team and another uh, 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 award-winning um, uh, athletic group. And uh, so there was a lot going on. Uh, and finally, I um, uh, attended a Wilson High School PTA meeting where I got to uh, 
uh, to watch the way they conduct business, and it was very, very Im impressive. Uh, I've got a meeting set up with a group of, uh, of senior students at uh, Wilson to talk about what their future is going to be like, and so it's been a very school board oriented uh, month, and uh, glad to be here. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Lopez. I'll be just brief. Um, I'd just like to urge LBUSD to prioritize modernization and transformation of Poly High School. Students' parents have come to our meetings to express their concerns with the conditions of the restrooms and school facilities. I too have expressed my concerns with the classroom ceiling tiles falling while students are in class. This continues to be a safety problem that must be addressed before a student is seriously hurt. And that's it, thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to report on a lot of really wonderful things happening in the district. Uh, first, I'd like to talk about the Bethune Grand Opening, and that was a very festive event celebrating the grand opening of Bethune at the Tucker campus. So it's moved, it used to be on the west side, now it's kind of um, more centrally located um, on the Tucker campus. We have wraparound services, and I want to thank um, all staff who made that possible. There was a raffle. They had um, representatives from different community groups there. Uh, it was um, really wonderful. Um, I also attended the Women in Trade lunch, and that was held at the Grand, and this event was hosted by the Port and it is designed to expose our female students to career opportunities related to trade. We had students from all of our comprehensive high schools in attendance, and it's, it's a wonderful opportunity for, for um, our, our female students. At lunch, we sit at tables. We have a couple of adults at the table, and we talk about um, experiences that we've had um, navigating the world as, as females and the students have an opportunity to talk about their experiences really wonderful so thank you to the port for that um, also I was able to visit Lincoln so a big thank you to principal Carrie Nemec and her team Maria Marsha Chanel they allowed me to accompany them on a tour of all the fourth and fifth grade classes I was able to see how they collaborate. And so as we went from classroom to classroom, um, every teacher was using the same materials and conducting the lessons. I was there at a time when they were doing math and I was so pleased to learn some new strategies in math. I loved hearing about how they are using um, real life information in their math lessons and so for example they're talking about shoveling snow at Camp Oaks so the kids can relate to that we were in a fifth grade class the kids at Lincoln are going to be going next week I believe it is um, to Camp Oaks and so the the teacher asked asked them questions like where's the math in that shoveling snow where's the math in that whatever they're talking about it's always where's the math in that and then the kids the kids also get um, math questions related to uh, maybe a staff member so um, the the question might be so Miss Hernandez likes this this pair of shoes and this pair of boots but she only has x amount of dollars what can she do and the kids have so much fun with that they actually talk about maybe how she can come up with more money so she can afford both whatever it is but what i witnessed what i witnessed was that kids were having fun with math you walk into these classrooms they're actually if you walked into a classroom when I was in fourth and fifth grade, you, you would not have witnessed kids having fun with math. I'll just say that. So congratulations to Lincoln. And also, if you remember, we had a presentation at our last board workshop, I believe. Uh, the, the principal, Ms. Nemec, and um, Ms. Hernandez, they were here to present. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. It was really um, a great morning. Ugh. So wonderful, okay. And then also, I was uh, at the Wilson Step Show, and it was their second annual 
uh, Young Black Scholars Step Show, both educational <coughs> and celebratory. Um, congratulations to Mr. Evans and the Young Black Scholars Executive Board. They all made presentations and then, so here's the thing. So they'd come out, make a presentation, and then a dance. Uh, somebody else would come out, make a presentation, and then a dance. And the auditorium was electric, electric. The, the, just the, um, the energy in that room was absolutely incredible. There were representative, there were college representatives that came in to talk about Greek life. Um, you know, for the males, for the females, whatever. They, they were there in pairs. They would do a presentation on Greek life and then a dance. So impressive. Um, anyhow, so I have to say, I hope to always be invited to that event because it was phenomenal. And then, can you believe it, McBride is 10 years old. The um, 10th anniversary of McBride was, I, I'm gonna say last Friday, was it last Friday? Time is zooming by, so it's hard to tell. Um, so congratulations, congratulations to the Wolf Pack, Wolf Pack for this uh, milestone, on the milestone occasion. Um, there were many, many people on hand to celebrate. We had f the uh, members of the first graduating class. We had our first McBride principal, Mr. Rockenbach. Um, also, there was a, a, a presentation, an opportunity to open a time capsule, and then I noticed that they had added kind of a street sign that said Rockenbach Way as kind of, you know, right? A little homage, homage to the first principal. I thought that was wonderful. Um, and also, there were members of the McBride family that were there. And yeah, so cool. And they, you know, they, they come with their, um, their own pride and stories of, of um, their patriarch. And um, it was a wonderful event, and I'm so happy to be a part of that. And then finally, I want to congratulate uh, Milliken's Jason Parra. Is it Jason? Yeah, Jason Parra. I know we've been talking about him, but I just want to read a little, a little uh, excerpt from the uh, Grunion Gazette. Um, at Woodward Park in Fresno, the superstar senior made more history for his school and his city by winning the boys' Division I state championship in a time of 1456.8, uh, becoming just the second state champion ever from Long Beach. Cross country. In cross country, I should have mentioned that. Thank you. Okay, so Dr. Baker. Thank you. I have a number of things to recognize tonight. And the first thing I'd like to um, just acknowledge a number of items that were on tonight's consent calendar that speak to expanded learning opportunities. And just, just to share that schools are using their expanded learning opportunities funds for STEM opportunities, for art, for skateboarding, for hair braiding, for basketball, for music programs like Jazz Angels, for theater programs, for the YMCA's playground partners, ground education, and for expand, we're using it also for expanded childcare for, for families who attend Long Beach City College. And so those are coming to you at every meeting as schools and their communities determine, but what a wide range of opportunities are taking place across the city. The second thing I'd like to feature is this week, three days of training that 12 of our middle schools are taking part in. That is the Family Leadership Incorporated Parenting Partners and Calm and Kind Family Facilitator Training. So these are middle school teams that include teachers, um, teachers on special assignments, social workers, administrators that are developing greater skill to engage with their families, that they will use these in um, training sessions and interacting with parents. The teams included include still their training tomorrow 16 parents and parent leaders who are participating and working through new ways to engage with families and to empower families in their homes around um, parenting and how they can how they can enrich their parenting skills and be more connected to our school so I want to thank equity engagement and partnerships office dr. Lucy Salazar and team have been wonderful in leading that effort 
Um, thank you again. I just want to make mention we had Gemma's report about the audit, but to have a $1.2 or $3 billion budget with no findings is really incredible. So thank you, Yumi and Renee and team, and for all the things that go into the day-to-day -day work that contributes to an audit that has no findings. I'd like to recognize Axel, who was featured in an article by the uh, reporter from the Signal Hill Tribune that paints a beautiful picture of who Axel is as a student board member and also his aspirations into adulthood. So congratulations to you. Um, I, on Monday evening, got to celebrate Dr. Mildred Garcia's appointment to the CSU chancellor position. She's the first Latina to be appointed to this position of CSU chancellor, which is the largest four-year university system in the country. She was wonderful to get to know, and lots of educators in the room and uh, members of our city got to welcome her into her position. So hopefully you all will meet her in the months to come. And then lastly, I'll leave with an opportunity around Vision 2035. We are spotlighting members of our staff, and an opportunity exists for our community to engage in that spotlighting. Um, in particular, to spotlight staff who are exhibiting the core values that are with Vision 2035. So I will read off the um, website, lbschools.net uh, slash vision star. And so I'm sure Chris Itzen will put that up when my report goes out so folks can see where they can nominate a staff member that will be acknowledged. And we're, we're working on all kinds of recognition because our staff are working hard in um, their efforts to embrace the core values and to demonstrate them out in their positions. So, and that is for all staff members across the district. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes our meeting. So we have a special meeting this Friday at 3 o'clock, but our next regularly scheduled board meeting is Wednesday, December 20th. So without any objections, oh boy, I almost made it, um, <laughs> we'll uh, adjourn the meeting. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. <laughs>